Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this final session of European Microfinance Week. The closing plenary is a bit difficult to get right because cocktails and flights and trips home are beckoning after a long week. And so we sometimes try to do th something a bit different and a bit interesting. In the words of Michel de Montaigne, there is no conversation more boring than the one where everyone agrees. So this time we are expanding on something that worked well a couple of years ago. And that was a informal two-person uh, debate on the promise of technology. This time we're doing something a little bit more ambitious, and that's an Oxford debate. What some of you are asking is an Oxford debate, and considering the current caliber of debate in my home country of the United Kingdom, you may also ask why. <laughs> in an Oxford debate, we are the House, and the House presents a motion. There is an affirmative side who argues for the motion, and a negative side that argues against it. There are regulated interruptions allowed from the opposing side. And at the end, adjudicators or an audience decide on the winning team. And the motion, like in Parliament, is either carried or not. As anyone who's ever watched British Parliament or a common law case knows, an adversarial debate is never very nuanced. The purpose is to win, not to find the truth. And of course, any topic worth debating is inherently nuanced. That's why conferences like this exist. There's almost never a clear right side and a clear wrong side to an argument, and that's true in inclusive finance as much as anything else. If it weren't, there'd be no peer-reviewed journals and opinion pieces and on the one hand this and on the other hand that white papers. So there's no claimed revealed wisdom, and it's the process of debating where we can find truth. Or as Joseph Joubert said, it's better to debate a question without settling it than to settle a question without debating it. So a debate is different than a discussion. It's competitive by definition. It means participants have to take a strong position in opposition to one another, even if they themselves don't personally hold those opinions. The nuance is found in the middle and between the affirmative and the negative side. I mention all this because I'd like to thank in advance these four brilliant people for being brave enough to take part. Their briefing was to take a side of the argument that they were given and argue it as if there isn't any nuance. They're speaking in individual capacities tonight and they're taking part for the, the sport, the spectacle, and so that we can close this excellent conference with something to remember. So what does room for the little guy have to do with microfinance? What is the motion that claims there is no room left? This debate is an adaptation of a session proposal put forward by the EIB, and we're very grateful that Enrico Pini and Julia Saad on the adjudication panel here uh, joined, are joined by our own chairwoman, uh, Laura Henrico. So what does it mean? Microfinance in some key markets has been facing headwinds in the last three years. Many MFIs that were supposed to be on a strong growth trajectory have fallen short of expectations, and they struggle to reach scale. At the same time, smaller institutions, tier two and three MFIs, sometimes can have more resilience to shocks but, and closer relationships with clients too, but are probably limited in their, the scale they can reach. So is there a continued role for these smaller MFIs? Or indeed, is the trend towards consolidation among a smaller number of large players? The motion before you, as you can see behind me, is that this house believes there's no room left for the little guy. That means the affirmative side is arguing that there's no room left. They're arguing for the inevitability of consolidation among larger institutions. The negative side argues that there is room left for the little guy, for the tier two, tier three MFI. For these purposes, the teams have thankfully agreed on the definition of tier two and three MFIs, and we're going with the micro rate CGAP one of under $50 million total assets, uh, tier two or threes. So this is how it's gonna work. We've got uh, two speakers per team, five minutes per speaker, and then a maximum three minute rebuttal by one speaker from either side. Points of information are allowed. This is a interruption by the team that is not speaking at the time, and 
the, it'll be a maximum 10 second question or point that the speaker can either accept an answer or reject. It has to be on point and I can cut it off for timing or relevance if it's not on point. I've introduced our adjudicators already. While they confer at the end, uh, there'll be an opportunity for any questions or observations from the audience if you'd like, um, and then they will announce the winning team. After that, Laura is going to close the conference. So the running order will be first affirmative, which is Maria Teresa, first negative, which is Kaspar, second affirmative, Alex, second negative, Maud, and then a rebuttal from either side. So let's introduce them briefly. Uh, Maria Teresa has been working in the emerging markets finance sector for over 20 years. She's worked for several development banks and financial institutions like the EBRD, ADB, ODI, and the OECD Development Center. She contributed to the development of dedicated financial instruments for local commercial banks entering the SME sector and for MFIs. In 2012, she was CIO and responsible for the top-down part of the investment process at Blue Orchard, and she now leads the blended finance impact management team and is responsible for PPP funds under their management. Alex Silva is founder and partner of Omtrix, a privately owned Costa Rica-based fund management and financial consulting company specializing in the provision of services to the financial inclusion industry. He's had multiple consulting assignments throughout the world, uh, including IFC, IADB, and a long list that I would take me three minutes to read through. Kaspar van Sleven is managing director of LMDF, and if you think I didn't have to pr practice to pronounce his surname with my Anglo-Saxon accent, you're mistaken. Uh, before joining LMDF, uh, Kaspar was involved in microfinance since 2006 as a med member of the credit committee of the finance program of MFI's Luxmint, managed by ADA. He's worked at the ILO, Planet Rating, and he's a visiting lecturer at the University of Luxembourg. Last but not least, Maud Massou is an international development and inclusive finance consultant. She's currently advising IDO, which is an NGO supporting rural communities to access drinking water. And she previously worked for Care International UK as a senior microfinance advisor. She's worked a lot with various VSLA projects around the world and other NGOs. Right, that's enough from me. Let's get on with it. I will be enforcing time limits very strictly. This is not a panel discussion where people can rabble on. And the speakers have been briefed, and they know not to be offended when they get cut off. So please put your hands together for a very warm welcome to the first affirmative speaker, uh, Maria Teresa Zafia. Thanks. Thank you. So first of all, I'd like to start um, saying that, as usual, it's not uh, a uh, zero-sum game. Uh, there is an evolution that goes from uh, tier three to tier two uh, to tier one. Um, but as many of you in this room know, we have a huge challenge in front of us to achieving the SDGs. As you know, there is a financing gap of uh, 2.5 trillion per year. And of course, financial inclusion, I'm convinced that everybody in this room would be supporting me in this statement. Financial inclusion is absolutely crucial and central if we want to achieve a number of the SDGs. So if we want to scale up activities to achieve the SDGs, we have, of course, to mobilize investment opportunities. We have to mobilize capital from the private sector, from commercial investors. So the crowd that we have in front of us today is a crowd of all of you that are the practitioners, are the converted, which is great. But in order to mobilize commercial capital from mainstream investors, we need to have a much bigger engagement of investors out there, the mainstream investors. How do we get there? How can we do that? So we can do that by supporting top-tier institutions. And why top-tier institutions are more attractive to commercial capital? Very often they are regulated, uh, they have incredible outreach in terms of number of uh, clients, and indeed 
they can attract big institutional investors. So the statement is clear, if we want to make a change and if we want to be active in scale in the market of financial inclusion, top tier institutions are the way to go forward. These are, in, these are institutions where we can develop a number of financing instruments. So they will, we will be able to mobilize debt, mobilize equity, mobilize you know, fintech opportunities, housing, education, infrastructure, and have an impact on job creation. We will, via supporting top-tier institutions, be able to really act on the real sector of the economy. Today we heard that we are, the microfinance clients are 123 million clients. I'm really sorry, this is a very, very small number. We can go much farther than that. 123 million clients are not enough. We're not done a good job. And only concentrating on larger institutions, we will be able to have a bigger impact and outreach. We also think that bigger institutions, as they are formalized, as they are rated, will be able to effectively um, be part of instruments and vehicles that can be rated themselves. Uh, today, very often when we hear mainstream investors, they are looking at these pretty illiquid asset class, thinking that they, it doesn't meet their criteria. So formalization of this institution, of their rating, formalization maybe of tranches of funds as well being rated, can bring in a lot of new investors. I'd like to also make a point already in a survey of symbiotics of the microfinance investment vehicles back in December 2016, already it was indicated that MIV's portfolio financed by, um, the MIV's portfolio finance have shifted from 80% in tier two to more than, um, to more than, to effectively tier one institution. And this was back in 2016. So clearly there is a paradigm shift that has already started and uh, we just need to proceed. And as I said, the objective is really achieving the SDGs. Thank you, Maria. Teresa, next to open the negative side, Kasper. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start with reflecting who we are here and uh, what we're doing. So who we are, we are funders, uh, consultants, enabler of the industry. And what are we doing here? We are saying that the latest statistics, more or less, mixed market data shows 15% of all MFIs are tier one, 25% are tier two, and 60% are tier three. So what we are saying here is 85% of actors are no longer relevant to us. So um, let me go to basics of why we believe that is wrong. And I have three main arguments. Um, my first argument is, and this may not be convenient to Maria Teresa who wants bigger transactions and nicer integration of capital markets, but my first argument is microfinance is not a done job. We are investors into smaller microfinance institutions. We go to markets where the largest institutions in those markets are tier three in MFIs just progressing to tier two status. A lot of those markets in Africa and in the least developed uh, uh, regions of this world. So they're highly relevant to development, first argument. So if we care about financial inclusion there, we will need to work with those actors. And I don't think we can expect that big MFIs are just gonna parachute into these countries and solve these problems, first point. My second point is if we look at mature markets and what can be the role of a smaller actor in a mature market, what we're seeing is that a lot of niches remain unattended. So if we care about financial inclusion, not simply in terms of numbers to get from 123 million to 150 million to 200 million to 300 million to 500 million or reach the SDGs, 
Um, but we, if we care about quality of financial inclusion, we believe those niche, niche actors are highly relevant. So when we think, for example, about a market in Peru, which is a very mature market by many metrics, and where we continue to find very small MFIs with very relevant missions, and I'm taking an abstract example here, but catering, for example, to handicapped people, a group which is not able to find its place in the mainstream microfinance market, we have to think, is that relevant from a financial inclusion logic or not? And our answer would be very clearly, it is. That, again, may not be compatible with large transaction sizes and increased integration into capital markets, but this is not where many of us come from. We come from a financial inclusion logic, and we should think from that end. Maybe most importantly, and that would be my uh, last and third argument, is where do we stand today and where do we go from here? Uh, we had a very nostalgic session uh, at the beginning of this day, day which raised a lot of questions about mission and how, how, how do we move forward. And if we, if we use an image, we started uh, microfinance on a small widening pathway where we had maybe a horse with two people sitting on it to move forward. And then that became a bigger road and the vehicle became maybe a little bit bigger. And uh, now, to use the analogy of a tier one institution, we have moved uh, to a six-lane highway where we have a bus going ever quicker. And now we want to add a, a, a fiber optics cable next to the motorway because the digital will make us still quicker. Um, does that mean that direction which we are going into solves all the questions which we have with regards to financial inclusion? And we would argue, no, it doesn't. Um, because we know there's a huge amount of people out there left out of this credit-driven model which goes ever quicker in that direction through larger actors, more efficient, but it remains this credit-driven model, uh, increasing speed and sometimes uh, going at, into very scary directions and the debate uh, about Cambodia here has illustrated that well. So what we think is we may be at a crossroad where that remains one valid path, but not the only one, and where we will see uh, innovation and models, maybe more models which are not credit-driven, which might be driven by other business models, and for that to happen, we need innovation, we need a vibrant ecosystem, and we believe that ecosystem can not only consist of tier one institutions, but it needs smaller, more nimble players, and as we heard this morning, it's the NGOs, uh, and these type of actors who have the innovative capacity uh, uh, to, to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next to continue the affirmative side is Alex. Thank you. It's always nice to be on the affirmative side. Huh? <laughs> um, Casper, I mean, Maria Teresa was very nice, no punches. I mean, Casper started throwing some punches, so I was told this is a debate, so we need to win. I mean, uh, let, me, let me clarify some, some uh, and, and a reference was made to this morning, uh, to this trip, uh, nostalgic trip, and, and indeed, uh, it took us back to the origins of the industry, uh, to the well-intentioned, uh, and, and really, uh, where this all, all got started, to the mission. Uh, and, that very founders, those very same individuals are the ones who precisely have uncovered the need to change, to scale up. The question was asked and raised, can we scale up? Can we really serve the large numbers by staying small? The short answer is no. Uh, there is, this is a particular case in which big actually is beautiful. Uh, Casper made the point that if you stay small, somehow you stick to the mission. I would like to make the argument that this is not necessarily true. Uh, I'm sure you all attended this bright group of people on Thursday, I was part of the panel, that argued and presented a study that shows that quite convincingly there is really no correlation between the nature of your organization, big, small, regulated, commercial, with respect to mission drift. It has to do with other factors. So, what are we really trying to do here? We're trying to serve, to 
push financial inclusion. I remember, and back to the same nostalgic group, when reaching one million clients was the objective of a summit. That was one million. We're now at 100 million, and we just heard Maria Teresa say there is a lot more to do. You cannot do that unless, and this was something that we all realized a while ago, you can't do that unless you scale up, unless you really get in touch with the capital markets. That necessarily means that you need to become somewhat commercial, for the most part regulated. That you cannot accomplish unless you achieve some size. There are efficiencies, there are economies of scale in being big. There is uh, always the fact that as the industry matures, and the reference was made to Casper that according to Maria Teresa numbers, 85% of the players would become irrelevant. That hurts. It means that some of the NGOs, some of the small players that actually got this started will have to get out. I'm, I believe that needs to be the case, as in any industry, as you mature, as you become of age, some of the players will become irrelevant. There's a need to merge. There's a need for some of those players, actually, to go back to their origins and to do the kind of things that large commercial institutions cannot do, provide the services. Casper referred to the mission, and indeed, there is a range of services that need to be offered, but those services not necessarily have to be offered by a financial intermediary, which is what an MFI is. If you need to scale, if you need to offer those services, you need to achieve efficiency, you need to achieve scale, uh, and indeed, being, bi being big offers you the opportunity to reach those economies of scales, not only in terms of funding, but also in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the kind of services that you offer, uh, particularly, and as it, you know, this is the digital session of the microfinance week. If you are really going to go after digital, if you are going to incorporate new technologies, and Caspar made the reference to innovation, if you really want to innovate, you need to have the muscle to do it. That requires a certain size. I would argue that to really serve and to really be inclusive, you need a size, you need to be big. And that means, unfortunately, that there will be a consolidation, that some of the small players will have to drop off. Thank you. Thank you, and closing the negative team is Maud Masu. Thank you very much, Sam. Can you hear me well? You need to hear that properly, right? So I can't help mentioning, sorry, but Ugo Yankee, CEO of Arariwa, is here, and he's a very good representative of what this middle segment is. And this is the first organization I work with as a field officer, so I can definitely really, really emphasize only just on the important it is. So let me tell you a story. Let me try and explain why I think this is actually very important that we have those little guys here in the room and everywhere else. So basically, I think they are part of the financial ecosystem. You can't really go against it anyway, you know. It's part of the jigsaw, everyone is necessary. We're not saying that the big one should not be here. We're also saying that the small one should definitely be here as well, right? Because if one collapses, then the whole thing collapses anyway. And why? Well, the first reason is that the path to socioeconomic empowerment through financial inclusion is not the same for everyone. Just figure out, you can start with savings, and then you go into credit, and then you go into insurance, and then you go to individual lending, and you have an entrepreneur you know, activity or something, and that's the best scenario you can have. But not everyone is gonna go there. You have some people who are gonna step halfway through. You get some people who are gonna go just a step in terms of savings only, not even needing credit. So how do you answer the need of those people? And the reality, if we're looking really honestly, is that those people, they are mainly women, and they are mainly in rural area, right? So who is responding to those needs in the rural area for women? And I'm really sorry, but they're not the big guys. The big guys are not there, right? Who are they? The ones who are answering, they are the middle guys. They are the ones who are really trying to answer the needs that are really very specific. So we need to be very careful about, you know, ensuring that those people who have needs 
see their needs answered. That's the one thing. So I'm going to go even beyond that. That's a bit off track, but I think even they might need some of the kind of services that even the middle guys are not able to provide. The, the informal one step down. I'm a big advocate of savings, savings group, and I think those are also very much contributing to that. So this middle uh, segment will definitely always exist. There is no way it's going to disappear. If you go into any rural area, you will see that those women are actually trying to access a service that they can't access from the big ones. They are not there, they don't have the guarantee, they don't have the capacity to provide anything that will get them access to either an account or a loan. And also they bring something that no one else does bring. You know, training, monitoring, follow-up, training in terms of, obviously, you know, um, financial literacy, in terms of women empowerment, in terms of health, in terms of governance. So obviously, I agree, this is expensive, right? And this is subsidized. But you can't really have, you know, the whole industry that is completely sustained. You need to have some type of population at some point in their life who will get some part of subsidization so that they can start moving on. So the one last thing I would like to say, basically, is that far from saying that the middle guy should not be here, I think the big one should definitely be grateful for the presence of the middle ones. Why? Because they are preparing their clients. Who is offering sensitization to what financial ecosystem is? The very small organizations that are providing the first step, knocking at the door on villages, explaining what it is. We're going to have you know, those activities, are you interested? Financial literacy, who bear the cost for financial literacy? The small ones, they are still there. The middle ones, they are still there. Exposure to innovation, new type of products, digital. You know, they are first sensitized to those kind of things when they are at this very first level. So the big ones actually do welcome a portfolio of clients, in many cases, that is already educated, that is well aware of what the financial system is, the risk that it, uh, it embeds, and also the customer protection principle that people are actually keen to get, um, to get seen when they join. So, as a conclusion, I think, far from saying that there is no space for it, it's an emergency to maintain them in the financial ecosystem, so that we are maintaining a harmony that can really help every, every type of client serve in the best way at each level of its development. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a two-minute break now so that they can just confer amongst themselves about their rebuttal. Uh, technician, can we mute their mics? <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, quiet, quietly talk amongst yourselves for two minutes, please. Photo bomb. <laughs> I really want me to photo bomb. This doesn't go on the website. Okay, I think we're, I think we're good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the rebuttal from the affirmative side will be by Ma Maria Teresa, please. Excellent. 
First of all, I'd like to really compliment you for the fantastic uh, uh, rebate that you had. Uh, and, and now let's, let's try to break it down. So our friend Casper said microfinance is not a done job. I totally agree on that. We said only 123 million clients as of today in financial inclusion. So if we want to get there, we need to do something different of what we have done to date. Maud hinted that there are different layers of institution and services. Again, if we want to ensure that clients have access to a range of products and services. And here we're not talking only about credit, we're talking about remittances, we're talking about uh, housing loans, we're talking about weather insurance products. So the full range of services and not being treated as second tier citizens, then we will have to go back to tier one institutions. And more importantly, Tier 1 institutions will be able to offer this range of products and services at more affordable rates. <laughs> so, um, we also heard that innovation is done by institutions that have total assets that are less than $5 million. Sorry? Would you, would you have a budget for innovation, R&D, digitalization in a 5 million total assets institution? I still have to see that. So again, correlation between size and innovation and capacity of providing services is certainly important, hand in hand with affordability of these services. We also heard that gender it's only a prerogative of tier two and tier three institutions. Well, I don't know if some of you know, but uh, I'm thinking about Colombia, Women's World Banking, Popa, Jan, and all the series. They are top tier institutions, and to still today, they have an incredible outreach to female clients. So again, I'm not quite sure where they get their data. Um, we also have, and we haven't really talked about it, but we said that we want to have institutions active in the local capital market. Again, I see rarely a $5 million total asset institution issuing bonds. If we want them to be active in the local capital markets, they have to be bigger. Thank you. Okay, in, in a way, our motion is simple. What we are saying is we need a broad space to move forward. Whereas our opponents say, let's focus on these 15% and they are going to solve all and everything we want to solve. We think this is wrong. Let's go back to the arguments we just heard. Uh, providing a fuller range of services to clients. We know today very well that 80% of those savings accounts in these institutions are dormant accounts which are not used. So that's not really addressing those basic needs of clients in a way that works today. Um, we know that when we speak about innovation capacity of these big actors, which might be regulated institutions and banks who need to ask to the regulator whether they allow the introduction of this or that product so that they can roll it out and they look at innovation cycles which are very long and complex due to the status they have, that that's not necessarily the most conducive way to change things. But I think above all that, what we are arguing is we should today not so much worry about the people who are on that bus I mentioned earlier, because that bus is running and it's gonna add more people. We are not saying that is wrong, but what we are saying is Let's look at that large amount of people we have left behind by the wayside somewhere, some kilometers back there, and think about how we are going to come to a point where we can integrate them into a financial inclusion uh, industry in, an, in, an, in, a, in a sector which, which embraces um, all those different profiles, including a lot of people who don't need credit. And so if you're telling me these kind of machines are the machines uh, 
and they're all credit driven machines, are the machines who are going to achieve that, I'm going to ask the question, well, why? Uh, we don't have any evidence that they're going to be very good to include these kind of people and these profile. And we had a lot of debate during this debate about different customer segments. So this is basically uh, why we are arguing that we need this wider field of actors, including actors who start very small and might have radically different models. I think it's a bit of stretch of imagination to tell us that these radically different models are going to come from these large tier one banking uh, institutions. We know how they're set up, how they're run. They are big tankers. They're not the one who are gonna uh, change directions quickly. And they all started as a tier three, by the way. So what we need if we look at these new models and innovation and, and, and really alongside these tankers have, have uh, actors which, which change things, they will need to start small and they will need to start in an, in an uh, in a way which we don't expect and maybe don't see today. The question I, I started, I mean, who are we? We are enablers, we are supporters. Um, should we forget about all those actors out there and focus on these 15% of largest institution? And that, I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one more th round of applause for all four of them for taking part in this. Thanks very much. Uh, we're, going, we're going to give the uh, three adjudicators a few minutes to talk amongst themselves and put together any uh, thoughts they want to share. In, the, in that time, are there any questions or perhaps more appropriately observations from the audience on anything that's being covered? All right, have we got a roving mic somewhere? Uh, if not, then just shout, please. Before, we need the small ones uh, to really be the entry point for really poor people and we need the big ones who can achieve scale, who, be, who are sustainable, who can achieve numbers which are needed to get it done. Thank you. Sure, in the front, uh, you see. Thank you. Ruhidash from Bangladesh. So I think I am <laughs> opposing this and favoring negative. I am in favor of tier two and three. Really, tier tier one MFI is like a big ship. They are very far from the land, staying there, releasing their goods. And tier three and two, like a small boat, going through the canal, reaching their people. So. They are very close to the people. If you compare a big MFI, the people did not hear even the name of the ship, ship executive of big MFI. <laughs> they have never seen this is truly. But if you see the small MFI, they are very close to the people. They are talking to the people. So when they make any decisions, this is in favor of people, not just in favor of MFI. So I think, so um, I make a one conclusion really, if we want to have a good coverage, scaling up, really, of course I think, work of small MFI should continue and big should also continue. So small is beautiful and big is needed to cover a bigger community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more, one of you two, you can decide between you. Um, after. 
Uh, I think in this conference we learned uh, in view of the, uh, of the fintech uh, revolution and advance of fintech uh, enterprises that uh, financial institutions, um, by the way, my, ben, well, my name is Bruno Molijn of Oxfam Nova, that um, MFIs will have, to, uh, to, have uh, to, to compete with these kind of institutions and um, many will go down. And my question is, and that is not well, my thought is who will go down? Um, because there's also another problem. We also learned that rural areas will be left alone and very poor people will be left alone. So I would say my hero, tier three organizations. All right. Um, no, we're a little short on time, so thanks, but uh, we, we'll move. The, no, there's a whole range of hands at the back, which is very, uh, it's very heartwarming. But we're going to move to the uh, judges, and I think it's is it Henry? It's Julie is going to say a few words um, on behalf of the judges and EIB. Thanks. So first, we'd like to thank uh, the participants for this interesting debate. It's a nice closing, um, and I think we could debate this forever. I think the truth lies in the middle. Um, if we only had big institutions, uh, I don't think they would absorb all the capital. Investors will be fighting over them. And as many have said, how do we get to that tiny village, uh, to the farmer who needs the access to finance and make sure that they're in the ecosystem? Um, so yes, the large institutions are necessary uh, to grow and to move forward, but uh, we also need the little ones as well. Um, if you think of, you know, the financial crisis and too big to fail and, you know, we're giving all the big ones and actually it was the small ones who kept the economy surviving to some extent. Uh, if we look at a war analogy earlier um, on tanks uh, in World War II, I think when Dunkirk happened and it was the little fishermen who got the troops out, it wasn't the big tanks. Uh, so you need the big tanks, but you also need the little fishermen and you need the little businesses. In any example, uh, if you take one extreme or the other, you're probably going to be lost. <laughs> and for, from EIB's perspective, um, and, and probably any investor out there, we do invest in the large tier one MFIs, that's evident, uh, especially for a large institution like EIB. Uh, but we also believe that to become tier one, especially in a relatively immature market, you need to be tier two or tier three in one at some point in time to become tier one. We've invested in institutions that were tiny uh, 20, 10 years ago, and now they're tier one institutions. If we hadn't done that, they wouldn't be here today. So just in, in conclusion, I think um, it was interesting to see both sides. Um, I will not announce the winner, Laura will, but um, <laughs> all I wanted to say is that we definitely have to live with all elements and we need uh, all in institutions to be able to, to, to move forward, especially in immature markets. So thank you very much. Well, we, we felt there were, <laughs> I'll, I'll announce it then. Um, we felt both arguments were, were very interesting. Um, we did feel that we have to pick a winner and we went with the against. So congratulations to Casper and Maud. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and, uh, thanks, Alex. If you'd like to come forward, we've got in. the hands on, the, on top of each other, Alex. Okay. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Thank and if you could come over here for the extremely expensive, <laughs> <laughs> elaborate trophies. I have one as well. <laughs> oh yeah. So. Thank you. Oh, that's sweet. Thanks so much, Rod. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Wow. <laughs> oh, thank you, Laura. In case you, uh, in, in case no one can see, they are personalized coffee mugs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. No, you don't really. It's absolutely fine. Yeah. No. Ah, because we are here. Okay, you know they what? Let's. The photo with the Mac. Ah, the Mac. The okay, Mac okay. Uh, winner. Winner, winner. Ah. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, ladies okay. and gentlemen. Um, Laura is going to close the conference now.
Yeah, we got the chocolate too. <laughs> the chocolate is better than the mark. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I thought I could do something. Sorry, let's just ma maximize it. For some reason it. Or did it, why has it disappeared from full screen? I don't know. I think maybe because I put this down and I did something bad. But um, full screen. Did you take this? Yeah, how do you do that? Slide show? Thank you, everybody. I will just, it's my pleasure to wrap up and I'll try to do so as quickly as possible so that people can either take off or join us for a drink. Um, thank you for our uh, lively debate today. Um, I feel that uh, transportation has been a sort of underlying theme between the train Graham brought up earlier, the bus today, various transportation challenges yesterday for the conference organizers, but here we are. <laughs> so, you know, it's been once again a very successful conference, I think. Thank you for staying, so many of you, to the very end. Um, it was provocative, thought-provoking, um, energetic, and uh, collegiate throughout, and I think that's really the hallmark of, of our conference every year. Uh, we've heard a lot about the latest innovations, some of the challenges. We've shared those challenges, those, the, the winnings we've had together and look forward to bringing all of that together again next year. Because I feel positive, actually, about what we've heard this week, about everybody's work together, about the expertise in our field, um, and the energy that people are throwing towards solving some of the challenges we have, um, whether that's in the sessions, outside the sessions, or in the action groups. Of course, there is a theme every year. This year, it was technology. Um, that was also, of course, represented in the award. Um, and that is the theme that brings a lot of often new players to the conversation. Uh, it's what dictates some of the groups, uh, the sessions that we're having, and of course a lot of the discussions. Um, and we would like to commend once again the finalists for the European Microfinance Award this year, ISAF, KMF, and Advance Côte d'Ivoire, and félicitations une fois de plus for Advance Côte d'Ivoire uh, for winning uh, yesterday. Financial inclusion and technology is a big, hairy uh, topic, but also one that is key for our work and where we are right now with, uh, in the industry. Um, we heard from Graham at the beginning uh, of the conference yesterday. We also know from the Compass publication, which I hope everyone will grab a copy before taking off. That's our inaugural survey this year on trends in the industry. That technology is seen as both a threat and an opportunity both for the end client and the institutions that are trying to adopt that technology. And so it really is one, one of the things that we need to uh, not just, I would say, tackle, but let's be more positive, embrace as uh, an industry as we go forward. And much is happening, and we've seen that in the last few days. Um, and that's exciting and I think reassuring, perhaps, uh, after the opening comments that Graham made. Um, but I also feel that there's still a, a chasm that we see between uh, some MFIs and financial services providers that are looking at technology more as something to speed up existing processes, their need to digitize, etc. And then on the other end, we've got these new players, these new kids on the block, punks we might call them sometimes, um, which are the fintech players, right? Um, and they are coming to our sector, um, perhaps not as much as we sometimes assume, but they're coming in and they may not also know as much about our target audience um, as they think they do, or as we sometimes assume. And we've got to close the gaps there. What we can't have is MFIs that are afraid of fintechs, afraid that they'll steal high value clients, that they'll drown everybody in debt, at the same time, same time, we can't have fintechs uh, ignoring what the end client needs. Uh, we can't have them uh, assume that uh, they, they know everything about these clients that we have served for many, many years and for which MFIs are, are genuinely experts. So you know, MFIs and even traditional financial services at the macro level of the economy, I think I'm allowed to say that, working for a big, big bank, you know, must think beyond just improving internal systems and processes when it comes to technology. That's a hard enough task as is, not to be underestimated by any means. But we also need to embrace 
the disruption that fintechs are bringing to our industry. And lest we forget, and as we were reminded this morning by the founders, microfinance was, is the disruptor. Um, so let's hold on to that spirit and make sure that we continue in that vein when it comes to new opportunities uh, in technology. Let's not limit ourselves to tinkering around the edges when it comes to strengthening our industry um, and working with innovation. It's not only been about technology. There are many other trends that we covered this week. Um, client protection, again, thank you for the founders uh, reminding us how important it is to keep uh, empowering people at the center of what we're doing. Uh, social performance measurement, improvements there, constant reiteration on how we can do that better. Um, all things and many more topics that have come to the forefront. A final topic that I'd like to highlight is one that we've given some space to in the last three or four years, which is the humanitarian sector and financial inclusion. I think the people who are here uh, in the last couple of days from the two sectors really see the importance of bringing the two sectors together, finding solutions to serve those who are refugees, internally displaced, uh, or otherwise affected by these kind of challenges. And unfortunately, these are problems that are here to stay, not just in developing countries, also in the middle, also in what we might call our developed countries. So a key topic that we're uh, happy to keep supporting uh, throughout at the platform, and we look forward to some progress made to go beyond conversation to action. So finally, let me thank a few people. Um, I'll start, of course, with Charles Mays and his team, who every year help us out with some fantastic organization. The Abbey de Nuanster, of course, for this beautiful location, as always. Our translators in the back who have been working diligently. Thank you. Our many guest speakers, thank you for preparing, for getting together, uh, early meetings, late calls, you name it. Our sponsors, these guys behind me, of course. My fellow board members who also uh, put a lot of thought and energy into uh, the topic of the conference and in guiding the secretariat uh, throughout the year. And of course, all of you for coming. But most importantly, please join me in thanking the secretariat, led by Christoph, for yet another fantastic conference. Thank you. Final two data points. One, next year's conference, 20th to the 22nd of November. Mark that in your diaries. We will see you here, uh, many of you, I hope. Um, and finally, of course, a reminder of the topic for next year's award, financial inclusion and climate change resilience. Think about your network. Think about your work. Start thinking about your submissions so that we can recognize the innovation in that sector. Join us for a drink and see you next year. Thank you. Thank you.